Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Marissa Armstrong. I'm a public information officer for Clark County Public Health. We're here to talk to you about COVID-19. We have a few speakers lined up for you, and then we'll have time to take questions at the end. So please hold those questions till the end. First up is going to be uh, Dr. Alan Melnick, our Clark County Health Officer and Public Health Director, followed by Dr. Lawrence Neville. He is the Chief Medical Officer for Peace Health Southwest Medical Center. Then we'll have um, a few comments by uh, Clark County Counselor Gary Medvigy and then uh, Clark County Counselor Temple Lentz. So we'll go through this, questions mm -hmm. at the end. Um, and here we go, Dr. Alan Melnick. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Clark County Public Health was notified this morning about two uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19. The new cases are a married couple, uh, men and women, both in their 80s. This couple live in separate uh, long-term care facilities, but were in close contact with each other. Both were transported to Peace Health Southwest uh, Medical Center earlier this week. They remain, both of them remain hospitalized. Several first responders who transported them uh, uh, were potentially exposed during the transport. We've identified these first responders and as of, um, uh, and they're being quarantined uh, for 14 days. They do not have symptoms at this time and but we're actively monitoring them. Um, one of the cases is a resident of a small adult family home we're not uh, uh, releasing the name of that facility because it's a small it's a small facility. We want to protect the residents' privacy. Um, all residents and staff who uh, are in that adult family home um, are considered close contacts, just like any other household contacts would be. They're being quarantined for 14 days, and we will be actively uh, monitoring them. The other case um, the, uh, uh, is a resident at Van Mall, which is an assisted and independent living facility in Clark County. Our staff, our public health staff, are working to identify all potential close contacts, including staff and residents at Van Mall. They will be notified and they will be quarantined for 14 days and monitored by public health. And if any of them develop symptoms while they're in quarantine, we will be uh, evaluating them. Okay, thank you. Dr. Neville. So good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Lawrence Neville. I serve as the Chief Medical Officer for Peace Health Southwest. As Dr. Melnick mentioned, we have uh, two uh, patients in our facility currently uh, who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 today. Uh, they are being cared for by expert physicians and um, uh, we are following our usual isolation practices and our care guidelines. I do wanna mention that while COVID-19 is new to us and new to all of us, uh, protecting caregivers and other patients from contagious diseases is not new in our hospital. This is something that we uh, have trained for for years and um, have a great deal of experience with. We treat uh, patients with contagious diseases every day, whether it's the flu, norovirus, C. difficile, MRSA, or other diseases. We, establish, uh, we follow established protocols for protection uh, of both our patients and our caregivers as part of our care for these patients. The situation is rapidly evolving, as you know, sometimes hourly, and at this time, we are limiting our testing, which is in short supply nationally, to the most vulnerable among us. Test results are taking approximately 48 hours at this time to get back on a COVID-19 case, though that varies depending on the testing volume. We do expect that there will unfortunately be more cases in our community. It's really critical that we take additional measures uh, to protect our patients, our caregivers, and our community. I do want to announce that out of an abundance of caution and looking to our neighbors in Seattle and learning from them, we at Peace Health Southwest will be instituting uh, widespread visitor restrictions to protect our patients starting tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. 
Additionally, uh, we're in the practice, in the process of setting up a mobile lab testing sites uh, so that we can do testing more rapidly and more quickly. This is not yet available, however. We are uh, very committed to helping our community through this, as we have done for over 130 years. We deeply appreciate what you all are doing to help with this. One thing that we would ask is um, that if you have symptoms that you think might be COVID, that you talk to your healthcare provider uh, before coming to the emergency department, unless you're truly ill. We wanna make sure that we reserve emergency department space for really the most uh, sick among us. Thank you very much. Councillor Medvedji. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Gary Medvedji and I'm gonna speak by notes. I am speaking on behalf of the chair, Eileen Quaring. She wants everyone in the community to be as safe as possible, not to fear, but to take these warnings and precautions seriously. Everything that you've heard today and will hear uh, from Councillor Lentz in the reading of the proclamation and the comments she'll make, get all of your precautions through official sources from the health department and healthcare professionals. Remain calm, but take this seriously and adhere to all the precautions that you're hearing about today and in the news in the past and in the days in the future. Be safe, follow these precautions, and the community will get this, uh, get through this very quickly. Thank you. And Councillor Temple Lentz. Hi. In response to the situation, uh, Clark County is declaring a public health emergency resolution number 2020-03-09. This is a resolution declaring a local public health emergency. Whereas on February 29th, 2020, the governor of the state of Washington proclaimed that a state of emergency exists in all counties in the state of Washington as a result of the novel coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak. Whereas on March 6, 2020, the Clark County Public Health Department confirmed the first case of COVID-19 within Clark County. Whereas the Director Health Officer of Clark County Public Health Department has reported to the Clark County Council that beginning March 6, 2020, COVID-19, a potentially life-threatening infectious disease, was identified in Clark County. Whereas this COVID-19 can result in serious illness or death and have serious impacts to the health and well-being of the public and can overwhelm the health and medical system in Clark County. Whereas under the above referenced conditions, there is substantial likelihood of risk to the citizens of Clark County and the seven cities therein, unless further efforts are taken to reduce the threat. And whereas the conditions stated above constitute an emergency for the county, necessitating activation of the Clark County Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan and the utilization of emergency powers granted pursuant to Clark County Code Chapter 2, dot 48A, RCW 38.52-070 parentheses 2, and 38.52.110 parentheses 1. Now, therefore, pursuant to Chapter 38.52 RCW and County Code Chapter 2.48A, the County Council of Clark County, Washington does resolve as follows. Section 1. Pursuant to Clark County Code 2.48A.070, the chair of the county council declares there is an emergency that requires immediate measures to protect the public health and safety of Clark County citizens. Section 2, there is hereby declared an emergency as defined in the Clark County Comprehensive Emergency, Ma emergency Management Plan due to the imminent threat of the spread in Clark County. Section 3, Pursuant to the emergency declared at Section 1, county departments and offices, as designated pursuant to the plan, are authorized to enter into contracts and incur obligations necessary to combat such emergency, to protect the health and safety of the citizens of the county, and provide emergency assistance to the victims of such emergency, consistent with the plan. Section 4. The declaration of a local emergency set forth at Section 1 shall terminate at midnight, the first Wednesday following the 30th day after the date of the resolution is adopted, unless extended or limited by the County Council. This declaration has been signed by the County Council Chair and will be affirmed by the County Council at our next public meeting next week. 
Uh, we would also like to let you know that we will be having a special meeting of the Board of Health on Monday morning at 10.30 here in this room. It will be broadcast on CVTV as well to talk about some of these latest developments and get more information. In this rapidly changing environment, we want to assure you that the health and safety of Clark County citizens is our first priority. Public Health is coordinating with state and local partners to do everything we can to reduce the spread of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, within our community, statewide, nationwide. We're asking you, the public, to do your part to help us slow the spread of COVID-19. Please do not participate in gatherings of 250 or more people, and please follow all of the precautions that we know you have been hearing, perhaps ad nauseum, but they're very important. Please wash your hands with soap and water for 20, for 20 seconds at minimum. Please make sure that if you are coughing, cover, cover your nose, use a tissue, throw it away, then wash your hands. Please also, if you think you are sick, please stay home at, and avoid the risk of infecting others. If you think that you do have the symptoms of novel coronavirus, please contact your provider, call them first, talk with them, and make sure that you do, if you are sick, get the care you need but don't necessarily go to the hospital for a condition that you wouldn't otherwise go for. For the latest information on COVID-19, please check the Clark County website at clark.wa.gov. You can also contact the state coronavirus hotline at 1-800-525-0127. Thank you, and let's all work together to keep our community healthy and strong. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. If Dr. Melnick and Dr. Neville would like to join me, I'm assuming most questions will be for them. So any questions? Um, yeah, Dr. Melnick uh, and Dr. Neville, uh, do you all know the um, condition, of, condition um, of the patients at the development? So uh, if you don't provide that, I guess, why are you not providing So the question is about the condition of the yeah. two hospitalized patients at Peace Health. Um, we don't comment on patient conditions, uh, but I will say they are both receiving the best care possible and uh, being taken care of by experts in this area. We see these scenarios play out before where first responders are exposed and then go into quarantine. Uh, are there protocols being uh, followed to prevent this from happening? And do you have any concerns as the number of cases increases that other first responders will be exposed and put in quarantine and then and therefore you have not to deal with other risks? Yeah, um, the, uh, the emergency medical service providers are, do get information about appropriate protective equipment. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know the exact, you know, we're working on the, on the investigation here, and I can't give you real details about, you know, how it was determined that contact occurred. Sometimes that happens even in the best of circumstances, especially during emergencies and uh, during transport. Um, but um, we were able to uh, uh, to speak with the EM with the providers, and we were able to determine that there was some exposure. And now we're able to, we, we were able to identify them and actually um, have them in quarantine and have them monitored for 14 days. So we're we're um, we're working hard to uh, contain this there. But as far as I know, they were doing things appropriately. But sometimes in you know depending on the situation, there can be breakdowns and. In, and there can be exposures at times. We're really using an abundance of caution in terms of any possibility that there was contact. Do you know when these tests were sent uh, into the lab and were they sent to the uh, virology lab or did they come the uh, The tests on the providers, uh, the EMS providers. Oh, not the providers, the two new the, the, the two, the two uh, patients. Yeah. Uh, I believe they were tested through Again. through you at Quest, but yeah. So um, one of the patients was tested through uh, the state uh, laboratory, uh, and the other was tested through Quest Diagnostics. Where is Quest Diagnostics? Um, it is uh, located in different areas uh, of the country, but it's a nationwide uh, laboratory testing facility. These two facilities appear to be quite uh, different. One is. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, at the small adult family home, those are considered, we're looking at those as household contacts. So anybody in a household, if we had uh, somebody in a, uh, 
in a family, you know, in a home that was infected, we would be treating their family members who lived with them as close contacts, and we'd be quarantining them and actively monitoring them. This is kind of a similar situation. So it's, it's an adult family home, but it's, it's a home. We consider it just like a house. Um, in terms of the long-term care facilities, that's a, a much bigger place where there's more distance between people. And what we do in those cases is we basically interview the, the resident themselves or their family members, depending on who can answer. And we also uh, work with the facility to identify any place that that resident might have been or anybody they may have had co come into close contact with. So what we mean by close contact, besides household contact, is anybody they may have been uh, within six feet of for 10 minutes or longer. That's considered a close contact. Or if they coughed and sneezed in somebody's face or something like that. We actually work and interview both the facility as well as the, as well as the resident to find out who their close contacts might have been. Once we identify those, they're quarantined for 14 days and actively monitored. We're still working on that. We were notified about the positive uh, case this morning. We learned about that. So we're, 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 at, we're doing that work right now with the facility. That is, Van Wall is working closely with us to identify folks who might have been close contacts. I, I could give you more information about exactly where this person was, but there are privacy issues about identifying exactly where they were at the facility. I'm glad you asked that question. So um, as you know, during the measles outbreak, we identified every place where these folks had been. I'm going to, give you a long, I'm going to try to give you as concise an answer as possible. So it has to do with a number of things. It has to do with, with how, the, how the bug is transmitted. Um, it has to do with how infectious it is. And it also has to do with the, um, the symptoms that people have. With measles, we had, uh, we had an exquisitely contagious bug that if, you know, that if somebody with uh, measles, if folks will infect 12 to 18 people around them. Uh, number two, with measles, it was primarily airborne transmitted. In fact, you may remember me saying last year that you could be in a room two hours after somebody left uh, who had measles, and if you were susceptible, you could still be infected. In fact, last year, you might remember that we notified people who had uh, been through the airport or had been at the Moda Center last year with measles. Um, the other thing about measles is we're generally fairly well able to identify folks who have measles because the symptoms um, are pretty um, significant. You know, most people with measles get really sick and then they have the characteristic rash. Compared to that with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, you have something that is less contagious, um, you know, two to four people around somebody with COVID-19. It's transmitted primarily by droplets not airborne, so that the people who are at risk from COVID-19 are not somebody who'd be walking through an airport, for example, uh, with COVID-19, but somebody, as I mentioned earlier, somebody who spent, who was within six feet of somebody else with COVID-19, who, um, or was coughed, or, or for, for 10 minutes or long, or was coughed and sneezed on. Um, so you need to have close contact. The other thing is about the symptomatology. With COVID-19, we have a lot of people who may be carrying COVID-19 and don't have real significant symptoms, especially around this time of year. They may have a runny nose or a mild cough or something like that, not severe. Some people may be even asymptomatic. If the concern I have is that given that we know that there are more cases, there are a lot more cases out there that we know about, you know, we've reported three now. If I were to take each case and said, um, release, let's say they've been in the library or the airport, then, then the message I'm giving to the public is the only thing you really need to worry about is if you've been at those particular locations, the 
you know, the airport, you know, or, or the library or something, something like that. With COVID-19, first of all, we're all susceptible because none of us have been immunized for COVID-19. There is no vaccine. But the message I want to get out to the public, given that there, it is circulating in the community, we need to take the same precautions wherever we go. Doesn't matter whether you've been, let's say one of these cases was at the airport. It wouldn't matter whether you're at the, the airport or whether you were at the library. We need to use the same precautions wherever we go. If we listed exactly where this person had been, we'd be giving the, the idea that you're only at risk if you went to these places. That was true with measles. It's not true with COVID-19. So I guess what I'm not understanding is if this were in case, if it was in this room, right, and any one of these gentlemen who are standing close together, proxies, whatever, near one another, longer than 10 minutes here now, one of them gets tested and tests positive, test positive for coronavirus. The others of them are not feeling symptoms, but you're saying could possibly be a carrier. Why not tell the folks who are in this room today or who came into this area today so that they can self-quarantine if, in fact, they are without symptoms spreading? Yeah, and that's a really good question. So if we had a case that was in this room, we'd be interviewing that case, and we'd, we, we would be obviously asking where, where they had been. And we'd obviously been here for longer than 10 minutes. We would be, um, uh, if we felt that there was enough close contact, that folks had been within six feet of each other, for example, for a prolonged time, we'd be, we'd be informing them about that. We'd be giving that information to their contacts. Um, that's a really good question. If I felt that we can do that, we could eliminate the risk down to zero, even with measles. Even with measles, we weren't always able to get a hold of everybody, but we do the best we can. Getting back to these two recent cases, uh, in, in regards to the residents of that small adult home who may have been exposed, and then also the folks at the, the Van Malls facility who may have been exposed, have they or will they be tested? They will be. If they develop symptoms, they will certainly be tested. Probably not, because we're, prior, we're prioritizing where the testing will be. And, and I wouldn't know, if, if I were to test them today, and they were negative, let's say, how frequently would, would I be testing them down the road? The other thing is that they don't develop, if, if we can go 14 days and they don't develop symptoms, we're pretty comfortable that they're not going to get the infection. But I mean, if I test them today and they test negative, how often do I test them? Do I test them every day for 14 days? It's not really feasible to do that, and the risk is pretty low because if they're not symptomatic, they're not general, generating these droplets that we're concerned about. But if they go 14 days without developing symptoms, they reach the end of the incubation period, we're pretty comfortable that they're, you know, that they're, not, they're not at risk. More testing is rapidly coming on uh, online. So the state lab has the ability to do about 200 tests a day, which is about 100 patients a day, because two samples uh, per patient, although we may be loosening that up as well. The uh, University of Washington Virology Lab has the ability to do 3,000 tests a day, which is 1,500 patients. And then there's Quest and LabCorp that are online as well. So that testing capability is rapidly increasing. Yes. Um, so we had put in place about a week ago visitor restrictions mainly affecting children. Uh, as many of you may know, children uh, can get this disease, uh, but they often uh, get it and are minimally symptomatic. They don't show many symptoms at all. Uh, so as a father of three, I love children. And our primary mission is to keep our patients safe in the hospital. And to do that, we felt excusing children was really important. Uh, from coming into the facility starting tomorrow at 8 a.m. again because our overriding mission is to keep our patients safe and our healthcare workers safe. We are limiting uh, visitors even further uh, to allowing visitors in only with special circumstances. Uh, so for example, if you're the parent of a child in the hospital, you will of course be allowed and welcomed in. If, uh, you know, heaven forbid uh, someone is passing away in the hospital, we would invite family members in, but overall we'll be trying to limit the number of patients, uh, sorry, visitors coming in. And really that's, that's key for two reasons. 
and this goes back to why this disease is different than measles. Um, we uh, desperately need to keep our patients safe, and we will do what it takes to keep our patients safe. Unlike measles, so this is where the difference is, uh, our healthcare workers, our great doctors and nurses, are immunized against measles. They are not immunized against COVID-19. So it's imperative that it, they stay as healthy as possible so that we can continue to provide services for the community. As the um, kind of strain continues to develop on your healthcare system, how long are your healthcare workers holding up? The healthcare workers are holding up remarkably well. Uh, the doctors and nurses uh, regularly take me aside in the hallway and ask what more they can do. Uh, I've had specialists in other fields say, hey, we notice, uh, for example, that um, uh, a certain kind of procedure may be less needed right now, but can we pitch in and help in some other way uh, with this? Now, that's not to say that there aren't um, anxieties within healthcare, too. Uh, they've got families, they've got um, uh, their own concerns, and we really want to keep them healthy. So the thing that we're emphasizing again and again uh, to our colleagues is to wear the right protective devices so that they stay health, healthy and safe. And if they're sick at all, we, we ask them to stay at home. Yeah, so we've, act, you know, a while ago we activated our uh, incident command. We have an incident management team. So as you can imagine, um, this is taking more uh, additional resources. So we've uh, reassigned staff, to, uh, some staff to work in, uh, in our incident command. I mean, a lot of the work around contact investigation, monitoring takes a lot of staff time. So we have done that. I want to mention one other thing about this location. Uh, uh, situation is, you know, unlike measles, where um, where the only real the, the best prevention really was vaccination. Um, otherwise, you know, it's exquisitely contagious. No matter where you go um, with COVID-19, there's a lot you can do to protect yourself. I think Councillor Lentz has already mentioned a list of things you can do to protect yourself. That wasn't available, unfortunately, with measles. I mean, fortunately, with measles, we had vaccine. With COVID-19, you know, the message about um, you know, wash your hands frequently, um, avoid touching surfaces, don't touch your nose and your eyes and your mouth, uh, hand wash frequently. There's a lot people can do no matter what location they end up in in the community. And we've also already recommended that, you know, gatherings of 250 or more, um, uh, people should avoid that. We also got a recommendation, you know, my concern is, uh, is the elderly population who are most at risk of complications from this. We've already got a recommendation out that, you know, people who are over the age of 60 or have other chronic health conditions should really consider whether they want to go to public events or, go, you know, attend public gatherings, regardless of the size. So with COVID-19, unfortunately, there's no immunization, but there's a lot of things people can do to protect themselves from getting this infection wherever they travel in the community. There's been a lot of discussion with the school districts. Um, I would probably, I, at this point, I'd probably refer you to the school districts so they can answer themselves. I don't want to, I don't want to speak for them, um, but th there's a lot of things that they're considering, including whether to, um, you know, close or something like that. Well, the, the adult family um, uh, home is a pretty small number of people. A uh, Van Mall, um, I don't have the exact numbers for you at this moment. I believe that, I, I don't want to speculate on this here. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.